The inner tribal man of mystery has arrived to entertain you this afternoon. My personal friend, my Pueblo brother, probably one of the most dashing and intelligent and creative native Kiwa, Kiwa, Kiwa man to ever walk the face of Mother Earth. I would like to introduce Mr. Ricardo Cate. Oh, apparently she doesn't know me very well. Yeah, I was just talking to my friend Rick Iannucci over here, and I hadn't seen him for a couple of years, but uh, a lot of other people that I saw earlier, they kept telling me, oh, Ricardo, you lost weight. And I'm like, I'm, I'm no, and, and I, it, it's really different when, when, when white people lose weight. People tell you, oh, you lost weight, you look great. But if you're Native American, you lose weight. People are like, oh, you lost weight, are you sick? <laughs> So that's why everyone thinks like, I'm sick or something, but I'm actually really uh, uh, in the best health of my life. Um, is that how you say it? Happy Indigenous, I can't even say it. Happy Indigenous People Day, by the way. Yeah, I guess I'm up here to, to, to tell you a few stories, but um, I want to tell you one kind of a personal one. And uh, some of you may have heard it, but uh, most of you have it. And uh, it's a personal story and it kind of explains how we are indigenous people are, how we are. So I'm gonna take you back to my high school days when uh, at age 15, my father dropped me off at a boarding school in Southern Colorado. And uh, it was actually a boarding dormitory where the Indian kids there were bused from the dormitory to the actual school, which was a mile away in the town of Ignacio in Southern Colorado. And there we made up one quarter of the student population. The other three quarters were white kids, and then one quarter of us were, were natives. And so anyway, um, he drops us off at this boarding school, dormitory. And at that dormitory, there was 300 Navajo students, 300 Southern Ute students, and about 50 Apache students, and only five of us Pueblo students from New Mexico. And if you know your history, I don't know if it was my dad's idea of a sick joke, but all three of those uh, uh, tribes were our enemy tribes way back when, and so we were always getting in fights, right? And so at age 15, I didn't want to be at the dormitory. I decided to join the football team where my older brother was a star football player. He was really good. And I joined the football team so I could be with him at practice and not be at the dorms, right? And so I didn't know anything about football. The coaches knew right away I knew nothing about football. And so I would spend the whole time during practice for three hours just standing on the sidelines watching my brother play, okay? And two more things about the story is, it was the second year week of school, I hadn't talked to any of the white kids yet at the school. I only talked to the Indian kids and, and my two other cousins. Um, and so, because I used to talk like this and I didn't want them to make fun of me, and so I didn't talk to the white kids at all. And the other part of the story is my, before he left me, my dad gave me the only thing he ever gave me, which was a Timex watch. One of those cheap Timex watches that you get a buy and dime. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I cherished it because, you know, it was a gift from my dad. And so I didn't know where to put it. I didn't want to leave it in the locker, you know, to have, have it stolen. And so I was looking for a place to put it, and then I figured it out. When I put on my shoulder pads, and where you tie the shoulder pads right here, that's where I put my watch. Because then I put my jersey over it, thinking no one's gonna hit me anyway, and no one can see it. So okay, so there I am, two weeks into the school year, at practice, watching my brother, I'm on the sidelines, happy as can be. I, I didn't care that I wasn't playing, so I'm just standing there. And there's a break during uh, practice, and here come these white, six white kids, and I recognized them as my classmates, so they were the same age as I was. So they were sophomores, just like me, and so they're walking towards me, because I'm standing right, right next to the water hole. And so I'm standing there, and they're going, and they're talking really loud, as most white kids do. And they're talking, and they go, uh, I wonder, how, how long is practice? And one of them says, I don't know. How long have we been at practice? Oh, I don't know. And just when they get there, one of them says, I wonder what time it is. Right? I hadn't talked to the kids yet. So I turned, 
And I left. It's 2.32. This was a Saturday afternoon. So I'm, it's 2.32. So I took a step closer. And I go, <clears throat> um, it's 2.32. And they looked at me, they went, what? And I, I got so scared and nervous. I go, oh, it's 2.32. And they said, how do you know that? Then one of the kids goes, Oh, look, he's Indian. He can tell time by the sun. <laughs> and they got all, ex all excited. Really? You can do that? Really? Really? And I got so, so nervous that I had no choice but to say, yeah. <laughs> and they walked away amazed. And I'm like standing there going, oh my gosh, what have, what have I done? Okay. So fast forward to Monday afternoon. I'm uh, same, same place, same spot where right Nick's doing water thing after school and here come those six, uh, there's a break and here come those six kids again across the field with 14 other white kids and they're all pointing towards me and I see them and so I turn around 437 in my head 437 437 so they walk up and they say hey Indian what what time is it now Four thirty-seven. And one of them had a watch and they said, Oh my gosh, he's right on time. They can't tell time by the sun. And they walked away amazed and one of them said, Oh, I saw that in the movies. They can do that. And um, that's probably one of my favorite stories because um, we struggle to fit into this dominant society a lot. And we like to laugh at ourselves. And, and but but um it, I like that story because it got my foot into the door to this wonderful world that I, that I call it, you know, uh, well, I call it a dominant society because there's a, there was so much to learn, so much to do, so much to uh, absorb. And uh, it was my first step in doing so. And I think I've done such a good job that I'm able to take the, the stuff that I've learned and, and I turn the tables a lot in my cartoons. And, uh, uh, the cartoons are so sex successful. By the way, this is the only native cartoon in the whole United States that's in a mainstream newspaper as a daily. So, uh, so it was a pretty, pretty cool, you know, big accomplishment. And so, uh, um, and some people tell me, I'm, like, I'm famous, but I'm not really famous, famous. I'm just a little bit famous. And I'll tell you how famous I am. I'm famous enough that I can use any restroom in any of these plaza shops. That's how famous I am. So it's gonna expand, so, so uh, <laughs> just so you know. So, so it's a indigenous day. And so I was like talking to my friend, um, my non-native friend, and uh, we were talking the other day. So we're, yeah, we're, uh, so she goes, um, okay, so it's uh, indigenous people day. So. So we're talking, I go, so she goes, what are you doing for Indigenous People Day? And I'm like, okay, well, we have a lot of weird holidays, right, that we celebrate, but, but we know what to do in those holidays, like for Christmas, you wrap presents, give them to people that you like, right? Uh, you leave out cookies for Santa and milk, right? Uh, you sing Christmas carols. Um, for uh, Valentine's Day, you buy chocolate and flowers and whatnot for your loved ones, right? And so, uh, so what do you do for Indigenous People Day? Well, I told her, well, you know, here's what you do. You, uh, you go and uh, go find a, a, a white family, uh, go to their house, preferably a mansion. You, you barge in and you kick them out. <laughs> and you tell them you're going to live there from now on. Uh, no, not really. I'm just, uh, yeah, but everyone knows, you know, Columbus. Got, okay, ladies. Okay, no, everyone knows Columbus was lost, right? He wasn't, you know, it wasn't. Uh, he didn't know where he was going. He was just trying to find India, and so, you know, because they didn't have GPS back then. But imagine if they did, you know, she'd be like, um, "Sorry, this isn't India. Recalculating, right?" Um, but. Um, I was thinking about it. This whole, like, like before he landed for, for thousands of years, there's a lot of migration going on. 
people from North America migrated to South America, people from South America migrated to North America. There was no walls, there was no borders, there was no state lines, nothing. People just moved freely, which is really cool if you think about it, right? And uh, the other thing was, there was no racism. There was no racism. And then here comes this guy, this Italian guy, he lands on the shore, and the first word out of his mouth is, Indians, right? And we're like, what did he call us? Did he call us Indians? That's racist, right? So that was like the first racist thing anybody ever said. said. I, and I know it's kind of weird like, when you think about it. But anyway, um, here we are, and I just came from uh, the Santa Fe Indian School, which is just a couple miles from here. And there's like thousands of people there. A lot of the students, parents, and they're selling stuff. They have uh, uh, native dances like they have here. And, uh, but because of a mod uh, mostly native population with the, with the kids, it's, it's really beautiful. So if you ever get a chance, maybe next year, you know, go, go check that out. And so it's, uh, it's a really great day. And so um, I wanted to tell you a couple more stories. And uh, this one um, happens uh, to do with my grandmother, which was uh, her birthday just the other day. And so uh, my grandma, she passed away back in around 2000. And, uh, but uh, she was this uh, 70, like 80 year old lady that uh, was very traditional. And I don't know if you, uh, um, how many of you from out of state? Okay, okay, a lot of you. Well, you're, you're pretty familiar with the Pueblo uh, 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 buildings that we live in, the adobe houses that we live in. Well, my grandma lived in one of the older ones. She lived in the village. And, and during the summertime, they're cool. And during the winter, they're pretty warm. But when it gets really hot, they start to chip off, like the walls. And so her, her uh, wall, inside wall, started doing that this one summer, where she had a blanket hanging, this big Navajo blanket. And so she took the blanket off, and then all the stuff that, the chips that fell off, she made a big old pile of uh, uh, the, uh, the dry chips. And she added water to it, and she started mixing, mixing it back in the paste. And I watched her do that, do this. She mixes it back in the paste and she uses that same mud to replaster the whole wall and look really, really nice. But she didn't want to hang up the, the, the blanket anymore because the wall might crack again. And so she, what she wanted to do was she had seen a, a friend of hers, had, she had hung picture frames on her wall. And so my grandma, not to be outdone, wanted to hang picture frames. So she asked me to drive her to Walmart, right? And so I drove her to Walmart. And uh, she bought like three picture frames. She just piled them all into the cart and pushing, them for, pushing the cart for her and she makes the purchase. And I bring her back from Albuquerque and uh, I drop her off. And then I take my mom's car back to the outskirts where we live. And then my mom tells me, when you're done chopping the wood and stacking the wood, go uh. home to the village and see if your grandma needs help hanging the picture frames. So I chopped the wood piled it, I was maybe about 19 at the time, and I ran to the village, about two miles away, I ran to the village, and I got to my grandma's house, and she, she's sweeping the floor, right? And I run in, I go, Grandma, I'm here to help you hang your picture frames. And she says, oh, as you can see, I'm all finished, I, I've done, you know, I hung them all up, I looked, and they were all hung up, and then she says, have, have a seat, and sit, sit down, have something to eat. So I sit down, and she gives me this big bowl of meat, and I start eating it, and um, this is another story. It turns out it was skunk, but that's another story. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm sitting there eating, and I'm looking at, a, at the wall, and I go, uh, she goes back to sweeping, and I'm looking at the wall, and, and I go, uh, Grandma, the wall looks really, really nice. And she goes, uh, she stopped sweeping, and she, she goes, thank you. And I'm looking, and I go, but um, who are all those white people? <laughs> and she looks, and she's looking, and she goes, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, Grandma, when you buy the picture thing, you're supposed to take the displays out and put your own pictures in there. She had pictures of white weddings, little kids running through fields of flowers, and she started laughing. And, and I really like that story as well because it's it's basically just like the first one, uh, where we kind of fall short of uh, uh, understanding what how it is we're supposed to behave, but. Sometimes we don't, and a lot of people think we're very stoic, like like in the in the in the, in the movies. Like I'm supposed to be standing up here like this. 
right? But, but people who know us, people uh, who live in the state and are, are around us know us that we are probably some of the funniest people around. Um, humor is, is plays a huge role in our lives and that's, that's why I love what I do. Because not only do I find humor in stuff, uh, I find uh, uh, the humanizing aspect of whatever it is we're going through, whether it's Trump or uh, going through some war or anything. And I, I really, make, really make light of that situation and I'm able to do that. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, if you're still here for another couple days, pick, out, uh, pick up a, a copy of the New Mexican newspaper and my cartoon is the top right hand corner. Uh, 12 years ago when I first started, and I'll, I'll tell you this real quick, I, uh, I started, um, I was walking these streets, and uh, my mom sells back here, where these guys are selling back here, and my mom sells, she's not here today. But uh, I was supposed to wait for her one afternoon, and so I had two hours to kill, and so I walked down the, down the street, Marston Street, and I'm walking by the New Mexican, and I had my drawing pad, and I walked in, and I said, uh, excuse me, uh, I originally walked in to see if I could uh, find a uh, writing job, and they said they had enough freelance writers, and uh, and so uh, so as an afterthought, I turned around and I said, "What about cartoons?" And I had a, a drawing pad just like I have here, and and I and I showed it to them. And, and uh, would you like to see my cartoons? And they said, "No, you have to go to the syndicate to be in this paper." And I said, "Yeah, I know. I, I've seen your paper." And, um, and you're from here, and I'm from here, and I can just, we can just put my cartoon in the paper here. She, she said, no, you have to go to the syndicate. I said, okay, where's the syndicate? Florida. I'm like, Florida, yeah, yeah, that's where we get our cartoons. It, it comes in a metal sheet, the sheet gets here, and we run the sheet, and that's how. So if you want to get on the page, you have to go to Florida to get on that page to come back here. And I'm like, it, it doesn't make sense, right? And so. I, I stood there, I kept for 15 minutes. Finally, she got tired of me. She says, okay, let me see this color. Let me see your cartoons. And so she opens up, and the nine, 10 cartoons are in there, and she starts laughing, and other people start coming in. People, uh, pretty soon there's like 20 people in there, and they say, we gotta have this. Because they, like I said, it's a native cartoon. They're all native characters doing native things. And she said, we gotta have this. And so on October 7th, uh, uh, 2007, uh, my cartoon started off at the bottom uh, right-hand corner. Four years later, uh, wound up on the bottom left-hand corner. Four years after that, we moved up to the top left-hand corner. So five years ago, because the readership, 70% uh, of the readership was 50 and over, and they couldn't read the fine print because the cartoons were kind of small, they wanted to get rid of a few of the cartoons, and so they did to enlarge the cartoons, and so in order to find which ones to get rid of, they had to vote, they had a voting process. And it turns out that um, my cartoon, as of five years ago, was three times more popular than the number two cartoon, which is, you may have heard of Peanuts. Uh, but now it's at the top point hand point. And so if you buy a paper, if you buy one today and I'm still around, I'll sign it for you. Uh, they have them over here at the Five and Dime. But um, yeah, it's the only native cartoon in the whole United States, and, and I really enjoy um, drawing those things, or even uh, at these functions talking about what it is to be native from the lighter side, and, and, and you know try to get people to understand that um, um, someone had asked me the other day, Ricardo, what it is do you want? You're, you were up at the pipeline protest for four months. Um, you draw this cartoon, you're, you're doing all this stuff, what, what do you want to get out of this? What do you want the, 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 the dominant culture to, to, to take from this? And, and basically, I've, I've been thinking about it, and, and there, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of my friends are radical, you know, they want all the land back, they want all this, you know, and, 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 but, but for me, I think, as a social studies teacher as well, I just want the acknowledgement that this land came at a price. Come on. I want people to realize that, that, that it did, and that's all this day means, a celebration of the people that made it, the people who are still here, the people that gave their lives so that we could be here. 
I just, that's all I want is, is just the acknowledgement. And that's not much to ask, but it is a lot. It's, it means a lot to me. I mean, just a couple of years ago, this statue you see behind, right here, this one in this little cage, the word savage was etched in there. They had put that up there a couple hundred years ago thinking it was okay to call them savages. Well, a few years ago, they took it out. And so, little steps just acknowledge that we're not savages, we're, we're real people. And, and I honestly believe once you do that, once you put faces on these actors, we have an actor, our first native actor to ever receive an Oscar. He's receiving an Oscar this month, it's West Duty. I mean, we're, we're making huge strides here. And once you realize that we're people, then you stop putting us uh, as mascots or, you know, uh, uh, you stop doing all those things that belittle us, right? Once you, once you realize that we're, we're humans, and that's all we want you guys to realize, that we're on this ranking at a price and that we're, we're just like you are, right? So, anyway, thank you for your time, and thank you, Christine.